Today on Internet Marketing Pro, we are going to discuss what marketers need to know about the new FTC disclosures. Are you legally minimizing your future tax burden and staying compliant in today's complex tax code? If not, our sponsor, Michelou Consulting, has over 30 years of experience providing top quality professional services in accounting and tax preparation for a wide variety of clients like you. Whether you need tax return filing, planning, bookkeeping, financial statements, full service payroll, or a corporate or individual tax return filing, I personally recommend you contact Jeffrey Ressler. He's a CPA and his number is 561 237 Five two six four. I'll repeat that number again. It is five six one two three seven five two six four. And you can visit his website at jrcpa.net. That's jrcpa.net. And you can also refer to the description of this program, whether it be video or audio, that has a hot link and the contact information form as well. Tell Jeff that Chad Deckard sent you from this podcast to receive his special rate for listening to this show. Thank you very much. Broadcasting from the city of sun and rain off the Atlantic Ocean in Boca Raton, Florida. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation and around the world. I'm your host, Chad Deckard, and welcome to my Internet Marketing Pro podcast show. My shows will cover how to grow your business as well as topics on tips, tricks, and techniques, digital lifestyles, the future of finance, and entrepreneurism. Thank you for tuning into my show as we begin this adventure together exploring many great things to come. Now, let's cover a quick few annou- announcements like we always do before we get started. Like I always say, I really appreciate all the feedback that uh, I've been getting. Uh, but for those of you um, that are listening to my program on many different syndicated sites out there that my RSS feed pings, uh, a lot of you, are, I've found out, are leaving comments on those particular areas where you're picking up on my show. Uh, when I say that I respond to people's uh, requests um, or comments, I'm usually responding as if they're responding either on my website, which is cdeckard.com. That's my blog, and that's where I post the show. Or you can go to my social networks, which you can obviously access at cdeckard.com. And use it as a hub and post, you know, in the website or post on Facebook. I have a profile, Chad Deckard. You can like that profile and get updates. I uh, got uh, Twitter. Um, go to those places and add comments because that's, you know, the three big ones like LinkedIn, Facebook, and um, Twitter are going to be the main or YouTube are going to be the main four that I'm going to respond most likely on. You can also use Google+. Plus. So I would recommend instead of doing it on the hub or some distribution site or a news aggregation site of putting a comment, put it on those platforms instead. And I'll definitely most likely as quickly as I can go through them, I will respond to you. Well, all right. Well, let's get down to some business. As you know, I'm going to, going to try it out here for the month of May, going three times a week, see if I can keep up with that kind of recording schedule. So I'm going to do the best I can and see how that goes, and then we'll take it from there, moving into June and, and, and forward. But today, I have a really... Um, well, there, I got the thunder in the background. It's coming down from the government. Uh, it's something, uh, as far as what marketers need to know about new FTC disclosures and what's going on and things that you need to be aware of. And if you're marketing a product or service online today, you really do need to kind of know these rules, even though they're not particularly laws just yet. They're guidelines. But um, because... With the way the government's going in these times, uh, don't be surprised that a lot of these uh, supposed rules now all of a sudden become known as laws, and out of nowhere, people will start getting uh, you know caught in some sticky situations because of these particular rules uh, that supposedly some people think are laws, and that's uh, kind of vigilanteish, but. Let me tell you, I, you're talking to someone who knows that because I was a, a you know pioneer in the email marketing industry, and for years up until 2003, I had to deal with the fact that there was no regulation to protect me as an email marketing provider. I wasn't the spammer uh, with the Can Spam Act, so I had no way to protect me, and it was like walking on glass every day. And that's a whole other story. But let's get into today's program. You know, are you confused about the new Federal Trade Commission's disclosure rules and and how they relate to your social media activities? Because, 
you know, you should question that. Everybody should question it because we're all susceptible with what we've heard, how the uh, CIA is monitoring and using Facebook as the greatest database that they've ever could dream about because of all the information that we're constantly in real time offering up, you know, likes and pictures and everything that we're offering up for an intelligence agency to have that kind of information on top of what they already have on us. Talk about the ultimate database. So... Do you want to know more about what you need to disclose and how to make disclosures on social media to comply with U.S. consumer laws? Well, in March of this year, the United States Federal Trade Commission released the first update to the dot-com disclosures guide. And the dot-com disclosures guide uh, is basically um, a handbook that is used as a, as a rule book to basically follow certain guidelines or, or etiquette in participating uh, in social marketing and in media. You know, the environment has totally changed. First, it's important to understand that the environment in which this guide was first published was completely different than it is today. With the first release in 2000, the dot-com disclosures guide was an attempt to narrow the gray area of how marketing and advertising worked on the internet so that companies could maintain compliance with consumer protection laws. When the initial dot-com disclosures guide came out, we were breathing a heavy sigh of relief having survived Y2K. So I don't know how many of you remember that, but I remember it, and I remember you know staying up that night wondering whether or not the world was going to be the end as we know it, uh, which it, it was, but it wasn't. Uh, and we're still here, obviously, today. But there was no such thing as an iPhone back there because the first iPhone was actually sold in 2007. Twitter was six years away, MySpace was on the horizon at 2003, and many were eagerly awaiting Windows XP in 2001. So, even more important, a lot has changed since the research that went into creating the dot-com disclosures, guys, which was done back in the late 1990s. More than a decade of technology has come along, and how we communicate now is vastly different than it was even five years ago, let alone 13. You know, for the past several years, advertisers were trying to overlay new technology onto guidelines that never projected the platform. And in trying to do what's right, there have been instances where it has all gone wrong. And these are the initial observations. While the dot-com disclosures guide of 2013 does reduce some confusion, it does not entirely eliminate it. But before breaking down some of the key points, if you read the guide, one thing you'll likely notice is missing is how this applies to non-traditional business, meaning bloggers, entrepreneurs, and startups, for example, may not even consider themselves digital advertisers, but in fact, many are. In addition, many of the examples presented don't relate to how many online companies market or advertise their products or services. You know, in my opinion, the biggest disadvantage of the update is it's still heavily weighted towards big company digital advertising and does not provide much guidance for non-traditional marketing and advertising programs. I mean, come on. We all know that the majority of business that makes up the United States is the small mom and pop business. That's the, the spirit of America and entrepreneurism in this country. So, you know, we are this country and yet these laws don't address us and leave us out on you know, the side of the curb with no real distinction. And then one day, all of a sudden, Big Brother comes along and kicks us off the curb. And it makes it very difficult for ever even get on the curb because we supposedly did something bad. But, you know, we're all playing on the same level playing field. So when we, if we're going to make the rules, then we need to make the rules for, you know, everybody to win and be able to play equally. But that's not the case. And it won't be the case in the future as they go, the corporations go for more of a control grab over all the small people so that they can, you know, basically run the plantation. And I hate to say that, but let's get back to marketing. As marketing, brand, social media, PR, and digital professionals, you know, what does the 2013 dot com disclosure guide mean for you? With regard to consumer protection laws themselves, not much. But with regard to how digital marketing and advertising programs are executed, there will likely need to be some changes for sure because these are not laws. The dot-com disclosure guide is not a definitive law. Rather, the guide is just a guide. For all the times that you've wished you knew exactly what the law meant, this is your gift. 
uh, consumer protection laws that have not changed and that the FTC still maintains oversight of most of those laws. The truth in advertising laws has applied to every aspect of web and mobile communication since the technologies were developed and as they change. There is no change, in fact, that all consumer advertising and marketing must be free from deception and unfair practices. The guide was designed to offer insight into common consumer advertising and marketing programs that seem to be of the greatest concern to the FTC regulators. Okay, they apply to everyone engaged in digital advertising and marketing, period, whether you like it or not. There is no exceptions to the rule. If you participate in play, then you need to be responsible for how you participate in play. Since consumer protection laws apply to everyone who advertises or markets to the consumer, so does the dot-com disclosures guide. Compliance with the guide is voluntary. However, practices inconsistent with the information provided in the guide can be the basis of corrective action taken by the FTC. Well, why the FTC has specifically stated that they are not monitoring blogs, websites, or individual social platforms, the agency is feeling thousands of consumer complaints daily. And believe it or not, they are monitoring it, whether they say they do, because it's usually the everything the government says, it's usually the opposite. And you can bet it because of all the terrorist things and things that are going on, they are monitoring everything. Are you kidding me? Echelon is a huge program. I mean, who are they kidding here? A one-off inconsistent blog post won't likely be enough to draw the agency's attention. But, you know, a pattern of noncompliance by bloggers may trigger an investigation of a brand or agency's practices. Now, with the whole thing with CISPA and, and all the different things that they've – bills that they've tried to pass through, you know, into a law, um, it, it's very controversial. And But yet we need it, but we don't need it. But we need to be very careful when that occurs because what's going to happen is it's almost going to be like a false flag, like a, maybe a 9-11 or the Boston bombings or whatever it might be. It's just a, a problem reaction you know, syndrome type thing where something along the way could be created that would cause the government to lock down the Internet even more, making it more difficult for everybody to participate or if you're participating – you can only participate in a way or a fashion that is acceptable to them. And if you don't abide by their acceptance, which basically cans you into behaving to a certain way and only being able to do certain things, you don't get to play or you're banned from it permanently. And that basically sends you to you know, become an outcast of not being able to participate in modern technology moving forward. And I mean, God knows how that would affect you and anybody in the future. So let's get back to the marketing once again here. While... You know, the FTC has specifically stated that they're not monitoring blogs, websites, and individual social platform. The agency is feeling thousands of consumer complaints daily. And that's just always going to happen no matter what, whether they had a laws or not. Um, a one-off inconsistent blog post won't likely be enough to draw the agency's attention, but a pattern of noncompliance by bloggers may trigger an investigation of brands or agencies' practices. If you're working with a brand or an agency pushing their message on your website, whether paid or not, appropriate disclosure will be expected. As a digital marketing or advertising professional, it will be of significant importance to ensure all programs with third parties include appropriate disclosures. One example in the guide, which uh, I give you, it's called Example 21. Includes a sponsored blog post and specifically noted that the blogger, while including a disclosure, should have placed her disclosure differently than the way it was. I mean, just like when you're in college, there was a certain way of documenting a, what they call parenthetical documentation. And God forbid if you got that right and handed in your uh, your your uh, thesis paper to the professor and it wasn't done right, it would be like, gosh, you just dropped the grade immediately. That's the same thing. So you, you've got to follow a standardized format, which I don't think is a bad thing, you know. Uh, but uh, um, we'll, we'll jump more into this as we d dive into the subject matter. Well, while bloggers may be required to place a disclosure in accordance with the laws related to endorsement and testimonial advertising clearly the ftc is including bloggers in this new guide as well now the discussion has been coming up and i'm a big proponent of kind of doing this i mean i've been doing it because i need the leverage but 
You know, there are other ways, like I told you in other programs where I talk about outsourcing your social media, where I have, a, if you go to come, you know, contact me or send me an email on my website, I can refer you to a company for $247 a month. They will manage everything you can imagine. So if you need an assistant to manage your social networks, write articles, PR releases, um, post uh, anything that you need, manage your website, host your website, I could go on and on for $247 a month. That's what this next thing is about. Automating social messages may need to be reconsidered uh, because it could get you in trouble because they're not tagged properly and they don't have all this hoopla that they want as far as you know what you could get away with endorsements and testimonial advertising because there's so many people making fraudulent claims. But anyway, automating social messages may need a reconsideration. There are various schools of thought about automating social engagement, but those who use some form of automation will need to review how it's used and, if necessary, what changes may need. The FTC has made it very clear that the inability of a platform to allow for an appropriate disclosure does not excuse the need for disclosure. Hashtags are not necessary either. While hashtags allow for easier search on some platforms, the FTC has not specifically said hashtag use would or would not make a disclosure compliant. The hashtag is used by many across platforms. Some platforms are adding hashtag trackability. Others are removing it. The FTC wants to focus on the message and adding the hashtag sign before a word uh, or the number sign in, in another case. In their view, it is not necessary. Is it helpful for the brand? Well, maybe. But remember, the FTC's focus is consumer protection first, supposedly. Maybe more of their own protection, but back on track. Character-restricted platforms must still have disclosures. And what that means is that the FTC has clearly stated that if your advertising message and disclosure cannot be made in the limited number of characters then that medium may not be appropriate for you. Go elsewhere. Too bad. You lose. So the goal of the disclosure is to allow consumers to understand that what they will be reading or clicking on is an advertisement, is sponsored, or involves some type of business relationship that may have influenced the information provided in the first place. And this would definitely have an effect on affiliate marketing. And in the book, uh, we're going to talk about example 15 of the guide and that is in using the words ad or sponsor may be sufficient and provided before the message. So they're saying that if you state that at least it's an ad or sponsor, it made it very clear of making that disclosure, uh, you would cover yourself at this point. But I don't know. We'll see how long that lasts. But for disclosures that are lengthy or unable to fit in a space-constrained platform along with the message, the advertiser may link to a website where the disclosure is clear and conspicuously displayed, which I think is better to do because it keeps it short and sweet, kind of like a tiny link. And we already currently seem to be doing something very similar to that in email marketing when you could unsubscribe or check out a privacy policy that might be you know, might have a link on a on a form that you fill out or on a secure form. You see that there's a security to keep the information that you're putting in that form when you're online, like say social security number or a bank account number or a login to a, an account that deals with money or some type of a transaction. Um, it seems to be working that way. So I think that that's the best way to, to go. And I would love to hear your comments as far as what you think. Now, the disclosure must be clear and conspicuous. As we, we stated, as with all truth and advertising laws, the consumer must know that he or she is being sold to before reading something or taking action to purchase. And keep in mind that the advertising or marketing message may require more than one disclosure. When it comes to digital advertising, there are many variables that play into how you know a message is delivered. Sites are optimized for different browsers, mobile devices vary in size, apps use different interfaces, and yet the same exact information may be shown. Well, how consumers see the information impact their ability to determine the truthfulness of the message. I mean, I agree with that. I remember a number of times, even being as savvy of a marketing person and consumer as I am, I've gotten fooled on a number of advertisements. If I caught was caught in the headline, it attracted me, it pulled me right in, and yet, you know, inconspicuously, it did say it was an ad at the top or the bottom, but 
It was really small and really hard to see. And I only later found out when I was, you know, when I was reading the article, buying into the way it was formatted on the page, that it was really um, just a, a bogus article that was basically led into a, a, a product and wanted to sell me something. And I, then I, I knew something was fishy. So, you know, I think that, you know, going back to that, all disclosures according to the to the manual should be one, proximate to the, well, number one, proximate to the information so that the consumer does not have to hunt for it, like I just said. Number two, of at least the same size as the message. Number three, in the same format as the message. Number four, accessible on all platforms used. And number five, understandable by the consumer. So if you do have access or get, want to get access to this guide, I will show you how you can get access to this guide if you come to my website, cdeckard.com. It's my blog. And uh, you can check out you know, the dot-com disclosures guide and find out all the suggestions provided. Uh, and basically listen to this program again if you'd like as, we, as I go along talking about the, as you review the guide. Um, be mindful of technology limitations and quirks. Um, too because uh that's definitely going to be a key too as far as when you disclose things like you know between a web page and a mobile screen or a pad screen um, and whether or not they're zooming or not zooming in there's all kinds of different factors as far as where you place this you know disclosure despite all these unique characteristics of technology digital advertisers and markers must ensure their disclosures are seen by the consumer it is the responsibility of the advertiser to ensure that all providers, you know, and, and be it that their own websites, social media platforms, or blogs are capable of including an appropriate disclosure. You know, if a disclosure is included in a hover text, but a consumer can't see hover text on a mobile device, this will not be considered a meaningful disclosure. Disclosures that are on subsequent pages on some mobile device but not on others need to be standardized so that consumers aren't forced to hunt for them. You know, advertisers are responsible for ensuring their disclosure. In today's online media, it's not uncommon to find advertising and marketing promotions driven by social media shares or blog posts. While many brand and PR reps want to respect the authenticity of the hired influencer, the fact remains that the advertiser, the brand, the PR company, or the digital agency, etc., would most likely be held responsible if the FTC determines consumer protections are were missing and corrective action is necessary. You know, bloggers are often unsure what, if any, disclosure is required, since the consequence will likely fall to the advertiser. The advertiser, whether it's the brand, the PR company, the digital agency, or alike, should feel comfortable providing guidance to any and all parties and platforms about what disclosure may be required and where the disclosure will need to go. You know, if you want to, I guess, you know, if you want to use a hyperlink for your disclosure, for instance, like we were talking about earlier, you know, take the time to read the pages 10 and 13 of the guide and seek legal counsel to ensure that your link will be deemed adequate. You know, it's a lot cheaper to take that, that time to kind of know what you're doing beforehand instead of getting stuck in the mud later on when things are happening and pay for it later. Um, so, you know, like they said, you know, being sometimes the tortoise instead of the hare, it does work out and you will finish. So, you know, don't just link to a disclosure. Like, you know, we've talked about it, it, but the book says just don't link to a disclosure. How many of you have ever clicked on a disclosure link at the bottom of a website? How many have seen a graphic at the bottom of the page, you know, you were reading and it had no idea what it really meant? In an effort to be compliant, companies have formed to help brands, online companies, and bloggers meet FTC disclosure requirements. Unfortunately for the average consumer, these custom links or graphics are not meaningful disclosures. If you, an online professional, aren't always sure of what something like HTTP forward slash D-I-S-C-L dot S-E forward slash level six would mean, then neither does the average consumer. You see? So th this is not to say that hyperlinks to a disclosure page are always inappropriate, 
but in certain circumstances, such as when a lengthy disclosure is necessary or the disclosure is not integral to the claim, a hyperlink to a disclosure may be acceptable. So you just got to use your best judgment. I mean, one size does not fit all here. So for most circumstances that trigger a disclosure, a hyperlink may not sufficiently alert the consumer to information needed to make an informed decision if the link is not assessed. So in essence, you know, you, you better go beyond your means just to be extra safe because so many people push it and they get to push it for a while and then they forget about that they're pushing it later on and maybe it is successful because we're all trying to inflate and and build our bottom lines but at the same time that bottom line can be completely wiped out one day if 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 you're not finding how to make it work for you now using these guidelines and regulations before eventually them becoming laws in the future because you'll find yourself later in the future trying to find how, how to get to that space because anybody who's a marketer knows that it takes time and effort and development to create a sales funnel and when you change certain aspects to your sales funnel such as something like this and depending on how that advertisement or message is disseminated out there this is this is critical I mean you want to do what's right in order to stay in the game while those who took the shortcut in the beginning are now scurrying and scattering when this does become a law and it can happen literally overnight very quickly. And you're running and gunning because your sales funnel does not work anymore because it's not compliant. So try to get you know closer to the guidelines and to the pack. And staying along those lines now is better than waiting till later to catch up and trying to reestablish your sales funnel that you know could be working really great right now. So I would keep that in consideration. So relying... You know, relying on hyperlink disclosures requires the consumer to be sufficiently educated to know they must click for important information. Read the guide to understand what disclosures to use, where to put them. And overall, the 2013.com Disclosures Guide provides insight into what the FTC investigator may be looking for when evaluating digital advertising and marketing programs, claims, and promotions. The FTC recognizes technology is continuously changing. However, enforcement will continue to be scrutinized using traditional criteria, which may not wholly translate to these new and innovative platforms. While the guide provides detailed insight, what is clearly lacking is the when, and it contributes greatly to the what and where with regard to disclosures, but still leaves advertisers and marketers searching for clear guidance on exactly when one is required to disclose. You know, what are your thoughts on the new updates to the FTC.com disclosures guide? I mean, I, I really like to hear them. I mean, this is something that if you're a marketer and we are a community, we need to be discussing so that one day as more of us become more influential, including, you know, myself, you know, we can go out there and understand more of the playing field and understand what's good and what isn't good instead of leaving it to someone else or another group to determine what works, what doesn't work for us all. I mean, you know, will this make our job easier in the future? Or do you think it will be helpful in creating programs for online influencers or working with brand PR reps as an online influencer? You know, leave your questions and comments definitely you know, on any of those social networks and places where I distribute this program, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn. And let me hear what you have to say, because uh, I definitely wouldn't mind carrying this conversation further beyond even this program. And even though this program is being recorded on May 2nd, 2013, uh, this would be even interesting if you're listening to this in the future, maybe two or three years down the road. It would be interesting to see the aftermath of what we talked about today and what we foresaw coming, you know, or just the way everything kind of falls in place. So I am open to hearing uh, everything it is that you have to share or what your thoughts are on this particular thing. And that's about it for this show. If you like my show, please uh, consider uh, sharing, liking, posting, leaving a comment, or subscribing to my show. I greatly appreciate your efforts and support. And you are part of what makes this show a success. Like I said before, your feedback and helping me you know, get this program out to more and more people uh, totally is uh, very, very, um, I am very much gratitude for you all to help me do this because I can't do it all on my own. 
Well, that's about it. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation and around the world. This is Chad Decker signing off. Goodbye for now.